Hello. Thanks for coming. This small and perfectly formed audience um, for our session, which is called The Spirit of 13. I get confused between The Spirit of 45, and The Spirit of 15, and The Spirit of 13. Now, I'll, you'll see why uh, during the course of the event. There's a film and two different projects with different years, which is why. So we're going to start off by talking about The Spirit of 13. <laughs> there you go. Spirit of 14. Oh, that's because uh, this is four, 2014. Okay, so there's four. I'm Julian McDougall, and I work here in the Centre for Excellence in Media Practice uh, here at the University in the Media School. This is my colleague, Mark Redman, who also works in the Centre. And um, we're going to present to you the outcomes of a project that we did, and then we're going to film a panel discussion, and we'll probably have as many people on the panel as we will in the audience. So it will be a, uh, in a, a, an intimate gathering. Um, so we ran the project called Spirit of 13 in response to a film that was made by the director, Ken Loach, called The Spirit of 45. How many of you have seen the film The Spirit of 45? One, okay. Um, that's Ken Loach, next to Mark, at the uh, British Film Institute. And what we did was we asked young people to make their own films about social issues and political issues in 2013 in the same broad style as Ken Loach had made about social issues in 1945 and the importance of the post-war uh, inception of the welfare state. Um, the key emphasis in the project was on intergenerational dialogue. So one of the criteria for the films that were made were that the young people making the films had to talk to, feature, have a dialogue with people who had either been around in 1945 or had been around long enough to know about the impact of it. So the key themes were kind of political engagements and intergenerational dialogue. So what we're going to do today, I'm going to show you um, the end of the film Spirit of 45, which kind of sets up this challenge for young people to talk to older people about these issues. We're going to show you some of the films that are made for the project, and then we're going to invite a panel to join us at the front to be filmed doing exactly the same thing as we did for Spirit of 13, and ask you what you feel uh, about issues around young people's engagement or disengagement with politics in 2014. Okay, so I rambled on for twice as long as I intended to, so I'll go over here and uh, show you some film. This is a film of a film, so we filmed the events at the BFI, and what you're watching now is the film being shown at the BFI rather than the direct film, just in case you wonder um, why it looks like it. A, a caring capitalism, uh, uh, Miliband is talking about this socially responsible capitalism. Uh, it, it's a bit like um, the Arabian Phoenix, isn't it? No, uh, everyone's heard about it, nobody's ever seen one. We have to face up to the fact that again, it's, a, it's the market, it's the system that, that says that profit is the most important thing that makes the world go round, uh, that, we have to, um, that we have to take on. It's a hard struggle, but this system, what we live under, is absolutely rotten and corrupt, as far as I'm concerned, from top to bottom. It's rotten. And the quicker it goes, the better. of the failure of the right, if you like, the, the, the neoliberals and their assault on the public services, their failure, terrible financial global failure at the moment of the market, uh, we still are, are trying to make the case that actually we should go back to working together for the, for the greater good. And I think the, the NHS has been a terrific example of that, as have many things in this country, education and the welfare state. And what's so shocking is the people who are dismantling this at the moment are the people who grew up and benefited from that system. The idea of socialism is weak in this country and the idea of capitalism is very strong. Uh, capitalism itself is not strong, it's falling apart. But the idea of capitalism is very strong. The paradox in the situation is that the ideas which come together and which have traditionally been called socialism exist in a sort of atomized way right across the political spectrum. When you see the Occupy 
uh, people occupy against, uh, say that they're anti-capitalist, anti-free market. The corollary of that is that you're in favour of some kind of planning, even if that not an articulated view, that they want some kind of democratic control over the economy. That is the essence of the socialist idea, whether or not you choose to call it socialist, and whatever colour you, you paint it. I think we were hijacked, the working class organisations were hijacked by the, the middle class basically, that's my opinion. Like, and especially the Labour Party, you know, the Labour Party was, uh, you know, was a working class organisation at one time. And in no way, shape or form can you call the Labour Party a working class organisation anymore. The working class haven't got any big organisations that can take the establishment on. They don't realise that strength they've got, do they? They don't realise that power they've got. The working class can change the whole history as quick as it, as quick as that. They just don't realise that they haven't grasped it. One day, I think the 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 dream that those miners had on the ground before the war will become a reality and we will be able to take real control of our own lives and we will have manufacturing industry and the and the the, the, the day when you see our kids walk in the streets of Kefili and walk in the streets of uh, Abakanan, uh, 18 years of age and they've got their GSEs and they've got their hands in their pockets and their head down and they and they seem to have said they got no future and their eyes in hell. I think those days will one day come to an end, coming out of the dream that those miners had so many years ago. I'm absolutely convinced that the older generation, rather than being a burden on society, has got an absolute duty to come forward and join with young people and talk to them and explain. I say to pensioners, turn off the television, take their plugs out of their ears, and start talking about what was the, was the vision in 1945. What did we want? How did we see it progressing? What did it mean from the cradle to the grave? What did it mean to common ownership and for sharing and communities? What did it mean? And start to b rebuild that understanding of what sort of life we want. I think we've got a real chance to do that. I'm not going to say exactly the same as I said then in the real world. Um, so what we decided to do for the project was to uh, kind of take up that challenge. So we contacted the filmmakers, um, Ken Loach and the producer, and um, Rebecca O'Brien, and we said, well, what if we used filmmaking as the medium to try and uh, generate that intergenerational conversation that Dot Gibson at the end of the film uh, calls for? And then at the event that we held in London, we had Dot Gibson on the panel as well as Ken Loach. You have people who are in the film you've just seen, um, in the panel watching the films the young people made as part of our project and then we had the discussion about them. So that was our motivation to take up that challenge and say how can we have that, get that conversation going but rather than just invite people to like a community centre and say let's talk about politics, use filmmaking because that's what we do in our centre as the kind of methodology if you like for, for how, getting that conversation going. So what I'm now going to do is show you some of the films that are made by the young people as the outcome of the project. Always in the name of greatness, a greatness that's insatiable. Retreating back down the Thames to the heart of darkness, overwhelmed by the starkness of these rainy British days, by the steel and the glassiness of Canary Wharf, the capital of capital, where Thatcher began it all, where trickle down turned into look around and see instead the gated communities, the tales of two cities, where we forge broken ties out of speculation so that debt becomes the word that defines our nation. We've all taken part in a mass creation of a desperate, hungry credit generation where we borrow from the funds of our children's education. But the debt lies deeper, a debt that seeps out of something called national pride. We turn our backs on now and look to 1945, to our finest hour, to that sweet nostalgia, where we knew how important it was to have something to be proud of.
and so you swallow the double-think and remain suspended between past and present and time unended. But a prophecy is a prophecy, and a prophecy by its nature is fulfilled. And we can avoid another riot if what we're trying to build are real ties between each other and with the present, rather than looking back in time into other classes with resentment. Is this the land of heritage and history? Because it seems to me that this legacy is lost in a matrix of CCTV. Because those Olympic rings are circling more than a stadium. They circle our skin and we stand in the shade of them, still told to keep calm and carry on as if someone's invading them. But I was told that the walls came down the year I was born. So why am I kept back by wire stretching 12 feet tall? A patchwork pattern stretches out in zones below. An assault course of grey punctured with danger of death by electric shock yellow. And I recognise that effect, don't you? Well, let's just call it the Enclosure Act Mark II where the common land is privatised and the territories are marked under threatening skies. The fences glimmer in the shadow of high-rise and the reflection shines back in our eyes as we retreat inside ourselves, as we learn to despise the strangers who press in on every side. Can't you see we're atomised? And all roads lead eventually, not to Rome, but inevitably to the Westfield Stratford retail city. This globe of commerce, oh, what a thing of beauty, to bypass completely the local community. You don't see the crumbling precinct. You can turn your eyes from poverty because here, old is old news and we specialise in novelty. And I've been there. It's so bright it hurts me. In its violent attempts to pull me into ecstasy, I can feel it pulsing from the people next to me, feel it spread, trying to alter my identity. But if you look at ecstasy, etymologically, it's about being beside yourself, outside yourself, to be for a moment someone other than yourself. And isn't that what's needed to create a legacy? To feel a sense of responsibility? To sympathise and empathise and criticise and recognise a place where we want to spend our lives. Um, with pit closures and everyone losing their jobs. And um, she tells me even now about the stories of people who had lost their jobs coming around knocking doors to collect tins because they couldn't afford any food because they had lost their jobs. One of my nans had a little brother when she was little and he fell down the stairs and her mum couldn't afford to take him to the doctors to get him checked out and he died. Full time unemployment is really disappointing in the South Wales Valleys where I'm from. Um, people tend to either be jobless or they have a part time job um, and often people complain about not being able to make things meet. So I grew up in a town called Oldham, which used to thrive on the uh, industry of the cotton mill, the cotton trade from Manchester, and uh, there used to be uh, quite a few mills that were in there. And um, then obviously when the cotton industry like died out, um, the mills slowly started declining and started being put down, but the jobs were never replaced. So as such now, there is a high unemployment, but there's also a high... Um, like poverty, there's a high amount of poverty in the town because we, it's, it's never been a town that's had much money. Everyone was getting made redundant, like a couple of people in my family got made redundant and stuff. And it affects the area because there's a lot of people who are on the dole and having to move to council estates and stuff like that, they can't afford things and I think it affects, it affects their children as well because if your parents are on the dole then you get like a certain stigma attached to it. I think that we have become a selfish generation because the way the economic climate has gone over the recent years has made people have the attitude of sort of um, it's the survival of the fittest um, and they've forgotten about those legacies that, that actually brought us together um, like during World War II and the 80s and um, I think that tends to be amongst the young, the young generation especially. Like if people can get more than you by like stepping on you a little bit, then they will. A lot of people will. There's not, there's not so much this sense of um, people helping other people out and then being content with having the same as them. Uh, they will, they do always want more. I don't think there's anyone that really represents like working class values or anything because they are like as 
certain politicians that come from like um, similar backgrounds to us, like Andy Burnham. There's one particular MP called Dennis Skinner, um, who's been there since the late 70s. Um, he's never missed a sit-in because he's always said that why should he miss a sit-in when he's there to represent the people. No matter what his values are, he's stuck in a party where he's got to, he'd have to go up against so many other people that aren't from, that don't have the same values, that aren't from our background. And there is, like, on the political spectrum, they are pretty much right in the middle. And the NHS budget has been cut. Um, an example being um, Bronglase Hospitals, um, A&E Department, um, the budget for that being slashed. Um, my local A&E down in South Wales, um, that's being completely closed by the Welsh Assembly Government. Um, so I don't think there's a very bright future for the NHS in Wales. Have faith in the NHS if it's um, let to stay how it is and helped out a bit because the things I've heard about what's going on now. It's not faith in the NHS, it's losing faith in the government's ability to or the government's willingness to let us keep the NHS. So I want to see for my future. I want to see, um, I want to see a lot more people my age um, being homeowners, um, getting stable jobs, um, and just being successful in their life. Success, success is their aspirations, wherever their aspirations are, and wherever their, their ambitions are. If they can fulfill them, then that's the kind of generation that I want to see. I want to see a lot more fairness in the country, whereas people who need help get help. Huddersfield is a fantastic city, uh, town actually I should say, uh, biggest town in Europe apparently, and it's always been known as handsome Huddersfield. So when I sign letters that I take, uh, that I post out to friends or colleagues or businesses, I always sign it, Vic Watson, the handsome Huddersfield town crier. I've been town crier in Huddersfield for 17 years and I think it's one of the best things that I've ever done in my life. I love it. It's just lovely to talk to the general public. It has changed over the years that I've been here. Uh, originally, uh, there was no Kingsgate Centre, for instance. Uh, there was Venn Street and there was a, a church on Venn Street that doubled up as the theatre. Things change and you will hear a lot of old people saying, or older people, I should say, um, how things have changed for the worst. And to an extent, they have, I think. You could go out and you could leave your door open and nobody would bother, nobody would come in. And if they did, the neighbours would always look and, and, and do something about it if there was somebody untoward. I feel part of a community. Um, my far town lad and I've always gone back to far town wherever, wherever I am and wherever I've been. I love coming back to far town. Um, but I'm also a part of a global community. Um, I have this view that um, I'm a humanitarian, I try to be a humanitarian where I see everyone as my brother or my sister um, and any community I walk in is my community just as much as anyone else's. The community um, is now multicultural, uh, especially in Huddersfield and I've got friends in all sorts of different cultures. The word community is like there's so many different types of communities nowadays. It's more to do with like what music you listen to or what you wear or your sexuality. So it's not like, um, I guess, how it used to be with like the people living on your road were part of your community or in your town. But now I think there's more communities based on different things. So um, I think it's changed like beyond recognition, I guess you could say. I'm a 60s youth, 1961 I was born and in my community, there was a lot of racism. Um, nigger, wog, coon, sambo, regular. My mum and dad were subjected to various um, racist language. We were placed in social economic deprived areas, uh, uh, the migrant community. So in those communities, we called home. So we made the best of a bad situation. So 
I believe the, the position we were put in, in terms of the 60s and the 70s, it kind of forced us or demanded us to have a much more cohesive community and look after each other. I'm more concerned that the younger generation are the generation that are going to be looking after my generation when we're old and we can't do anything. And I think when it gets to that point, our, our economy, everything's just going to crash because they don't know anything other than partying, spending money, buying new clothes, taking drugs, drinking alcohol. And I'm not generalising everyone because obviously, like me, there are people who saw the choice, but yeah, the younger generation is definitely lost. In a way, I feel sorry for young people, and we have a few young people in this room that you can't see. And um, I am glad I'm the age I am. I wouldn't want to have to go through what these young people will go through when they get older, um, when I'm no longer here. You know, that would be morbid now. Moving to another country takes a lot of courage, especially without having much money to start off with, without knowing the language well, and without having anyone close to support you. You wonder, why do we do it? Our pastime in Anglia was provided by economic Интереси. В смисъл, че решихме, че тук ще ни бъде по-добре финансово и по-лесен живот за нашите деца, аз специално. Живота, тъй като в България е доста труден и не успяваме да се справим финансово, решихме, че се пресъединим цялото семейство да дойдем в Англия. В средата на 2009 година пристигнахме в Англия. Пресъединихме се към дъщеря ми и жена ми, заедно с сина ми Костадин. Дъщеря ми дойде да учи в Англия, в Солент университета. След това жена ми дойде да я подпомогне, но живота, тъй като в България е доста труден и не успяваме да се справим финансово, решихме, че се пресъединим цялото семейство да дойдем в Англия. Но като всяко начало беше много трудно. Специално за жена ми. Тя ще разправя. Аз съм жена на 47 години от България. Пристигнах в Англия в началото на 2008 година а, с българо-английска фирма, която в последствие се оказа фалшива. Many foreigners face many problems when they come to the UK. Uh, many fake job offering companies exist that lure vulnerable money needing foreigners uh, to the UK. These companies take the money from the individuals for their expert advice for their services and flights uh, when the individual or the group of people land in the UK or England uh, they go to the place of work um, and they get told straight away that there's no such thing. I was in Ashford, without documents, with a little money and with a desire for work. I was allowed to live very strongly. I was allowed to carry two packets of soup or two packets of soup macaroni. 5-6-8 пи. Това е в рамките горе-долу на 5 месеца. Единството удоволствие, което си позволява, това беше да си купя един пакет кафе. А, след а, известно време търсене на работа, а, успях да се намеря работа в Nursing Home. Края на юни си получих необходимите виза за работа и започнах работа. Аз съм един българин на 47. Емигрирал в Англия преди 5 години. Като пристигнахме, се нанесахме в квартирата, която жена ми и дъщеря ми бяха намерили. Беше доста малка, но на първо време не устройваше. Нашия син не, можа да си, не можахме да му намерим училище винага и той изчака няколко месеца. Мисля, че това бяха най-трудните месеци в неговия живот. Ти 6 месеца аз стоях без работа и жена ми се наложи да работи много, прекалено много, за да може да издържа по някакъв начин семейния бюджет. И тъй като 
Имахме още остра нужда от пари, работихме много изваредно. Мога да кажа, че в повечето дни, в повечето седмици сме работили 6 дена с един ден почивен, а много често сме работили по 2 или 3 седмици без почивен ден. На толкова време, което сме били тук, изобщо никога не сме взимали бенефити. Ние сме свикнали парите, които ни трябва да отидем да си ги изработим, но не и да получаваме на готово от държавата. As of the February 2013, 16.4% of working age UK nationals were claiming a working age benefit. Compare that to non-UK nationals, that figure was at 6.7%. Това го правим, за да може да постигнем някакъв стандарт и да можем нашите деца да получат една база, върху която да могат да работят и да живеят много, много по-спокойно, колкото с ние. Я кажи ми облаче ле бяло You can see from that um, the, the themes that were um, brought up in the films and the styles that the young people uh, kind of adopted were quite varied. Important thing to state is that you know some of these films are made on phones, so the film about unions is made on an iPhone, you know, edited on you know quite roughly with iMovie. That was that was made by a 15-year-old. Uh, and then some of the films are made by students at the university who had access to different kinds of equipment. But we didn't give them any brief apart from watch The Spirit of 45 and make a film that includes um, younger people and older people talking about a social issue that's related to Ken Loach's film. And the kinds of issues that were brought up in Ken Loach's film were um, the importance of trade unions and the fact that, you know, post-45 uh, it was like a kind of golden period for trade union membership, and obviously that's threatened now. Uh, the NHS, which everyone will have their own opinion on, but certainly one of the key kind of victories of the uh, 45 uh, government was the inception of the NHS. And then issues around community cohesiveness um, and, and various other things. Um, and so what we're interested in is, would the act of making a film in that way kind of energise young people politically in a different way to the kind of other means that people have tried. And of course, the, the flip side of that argument is the, the view espoused by um, Russell Brand recently. So I want to finish by just showing a clip from Russell Brand talking on Newsnight, and then we want to throw open the conversation to, to the panel. You probably be aware of it, but I'll show you it again. Think I'm ideal. But is it true you don't even vote? Yeah, no, I don't vote. Well, how do you have any authority to talk about politics then? Well, I don't uh, get my authority from this pre-existing paradigm which is quite narrow and only serves a few people. I look elsewhere for alternatives that might be of service to humanity. Alternate means, alternate political systems. Uh, they being? Well, I've not invented it yet, Jeremy. I had to do a magazine last week. I've had a lot on my plate. But I say, but here's the thing that it shouldn't do. Shouldn't destroy the planet. Shouldn't create massive economic disparity. Shouldn't ignore the needs of the people. The burden of proof is on the people with the power, not people like doing a magazine. How do you imagine the people get power? Well, I imagine there are sort of hierarchical systems that have been preserved for, through they generations. They get power by being voted well, in. Well, you That's say that, Jeremy. It, but you like can't even be asked to vote. It's quite a narrow, uh, quite a narrow prescriptive parameter that changes within the... Uh, the in a the democracy, that's how it works. Well, I don't think it's working very well, Jeremy, given that the planet is being destroyed, given that there is economic disparity of a huge degree. What are you saying? There's no alternative. There's no alternative. No, I'm Just not saying system. that. I'm saying if you Brilliant. can't be asked to vote, why should we be asked to listen to your political point of view? You don't have to listen to my political point of view. Of you, but it's not uh, that I'm not voting out of apathy, I'm not voting out of absolute indifference and weariness and exhaustion from the lies, treachery, deceit of the political class that has been going on for generations now and which has now reached fever pitch where we have a disenfranchised, disillusioned, despondent underclass that are not being represented by that political system. So voting for it is tacit complicity with that system and that's not something I'm offering up. Well, why don't you change it then? I'm trying to. Well, why don't you start by voting? <laughs> I don't think it works. People have voted already, and that's what's created the current well, paradigm. When did you last vote? Never. You've never, ever voted? No. Do you think that's really bad? So you struck an attitude, what, before the age of 18? Well, I was busy being a drug addict at that point because I come from the kind of social conditions that are exacerbated by an indifferent system that really just administrates for large corporations and ignores the population that well, it was voted in to serve. You're blaming the political class of the fact that you had a drug problem? No, no, no. I'm saying I was part of a social and economic class that is underserved by the current political system and drug addiction is one of the problems it creates when you have huge, underserved, 
impoverished populations. People get drug problems and also don't feel like, uh, like they want to engage with the current political system because they see that it doesn't work for them. They see that it makes no difference. They see that they're not served. Well, I say that it doesn't the apathy, work for them if they bother to vote. Jeremy, my darling, I'm not saying that the, the apathy doesn't come from us, the people. The apathy comes from the politicians. They are. Okay, so you get the idea. So the situation that we have, according to um, Russell Brand, is that there's really no point in young people voting because the system is set up in such a way that it would make very little difference and they wouldn't be represented anyway by the politicians. So our project is, I suppose, from Russell Brand's point of view, kind of barking at the wrong tree because we're trying to get young people energised into politics through filmmaking about political issues so they might then vote in the general election in 2015. So what we'd like to do today is have the panel come forward and uh, Mark, my colleague, will chair a discussion which we'll film uh, about some of the issues arising from the films and from the kinds of things we've been talking about. And thank you very much for your bravery. Should we give them a round of applause before we even start? Thank you. to ask each of the panel members if they'll introduce themselves and just say a bit about what they do, so we know who you are. Can you yeah, um, I'm Edward Lawrence. I'm a second year BA television production student. Um, I'm sort of interested in political filmmaking, uh, journalism, war and sort of conflict, uh, which obviously relates very much to what's going on politically, so that's me. My name's Alison Smith. I'm a second year politics and media student here at Bournemouth University. Um, I'm interested in a career in politics, I'm particularly interested in things like health and social care, specifically about the NHS and in young people's democracy. Great. I'm Aaron Jenkins. I'm currently in my last year at college, at opening sixth form. Currently study business and ICT and do have a good interest in politics. Okay. <laughs> Let's start with something really general. And um, what I suppose we can do is talk about ourselves and then throw it open for any questions from the floor. But um, what, what did you take from the films that you saw? You know, what kinds of things did you think were impressive or interesting or provocative? What did you uh, some, of the, some of the first films, it, it would appear that many people were very disengaged with the current political system. Um, but what struck me is that many of those people were older people, the older generation, um, which which could, I mean, I'm probably jumping into this topic slightly early, could, could relate to the rise of UKIP, for instance, um, the fact that 71% of their voters are over the age of 50, and that I think a, a large percentage of those, I mean, 60% of those voted Conservative at the last general election, uh, which I think says a lot, and I think the first, the first film showed that there was old people disengaged, and perhaps there's this view that there was a great pastime, and maybe you get touches upon issues from back in that time when they sort of idealise and we can hey we can go back to that happy time but actually in reality we've got a kind of messed up economy. So you were talking about uh, Ken Lurch's film, yeah. Spirit of Forty yeah. Five, which was the very first yeah. clip that we saw and which was quite yeah, it seemed quite pessimistic. It was interesting though. Yeah. Um, well that's quite interesting what you said that I mean the um people speaking in Ken Loach's film, they were certainly picking up on a pastime. Mm. And it seemed quite clear to me that the bias there was they linked this golden era to the Labour Party and to a particular type of politics. I mean, that's quite clear. And I think there's the danger perhaps of conflating um, back in the day with the yeah. Labour Party. And actually, UKIP does represent that. It draws mm. on sort of themes of, well, we, we did have it good, it was very good, it's not very good anymore, fear of the future. And, and this, quite a mixed bag of things that unpack Actually, there. the economy is very different now. There's, there's kind of everything is very different. And the elephant in the room, which I don't think was mentioned at all, is globalisation. And that wasn't touched on. Um, so when we talk about sort of things like national politics and what we should have, there was no inkling really that actually what we need to talk about is global trade or um, the flows of migration. I found it very interesting that the, the, the guy at the end, he said that we haven't actually taken anything off the government, which of course is Original people were saying the government ought to be there to, to provide. I think it's a very, very mixed picture. There's not one single narrative there, there's many. Okay, we'll come back to some of those. But you know, it's just interesting to see that maybe part of the old generation are looking to see that look, the system is coming up now, it's not working. That's what they say, most of them are voting new kids, they're saying 
I hope it's not my second But whether that will transpire nationally, we've seen this European election now, UKIP's absolutely thrashed, but will this transpire nationally, or is it merely some sort of nudge? I don't, I don't necessarily want to say protest vote, because I think UKIP should be taken seriously as a party, because they are gaining the statistics. And I think by saying protest vote, you kind of make out as if they're the monster raving loon party slightly. Um, but is it a sort of nudge vote to either renegotiate the European Union or come out of it because there's this view that it's taking away from us. Um, so I, I think I think that's very interesting. But it, it, in terms of younger people, um, I think there's a lot of young people that want to be engaged in politics that find find it difficult. They don't feel as if political parties are reaching out to them. And um, what struck me is I spoke to a Conservative MEP um, who I will name Ashley Fox at the European Parliament in Brussels. And he said, yeah, we don't target young voters. And I said, well, why don't you target young voters? You know, you've got a whole demographic there that, that could be voting. But no, we don't target them because they don't vote. And I thought, well, that's a bit flawed. And he didn't really seem to care whatsoever. Whereas his colleague, his conservative colleague, Julie Girling, was very much slightly trying to kind of make it sound a bit nicer. But um, I, that just struck me that the political parties seem to be missing out on a, on a, on a big chunk here. So from a... You know, you are a young person. Um, why, why do you think there is that lack of engagement, or is that just a, is that a, a bit of a myth? You know, is it a different kind of engagement? I mean, we saw some films made by young people mm. that seem to have some kind of engagement with issues, but not necessarily with party politics. Where, where's the where's the disconnect? Or I think politics, for a start, is not. It, it may be in some schools, but it certainly wasn't on my curriculum at either primary school or secondary school. I don't know about you. Still not on um, There used to be a politics A level at my school, but they scrapped it because they didn't have enough people doing it. And when they did do it, it was far too difficult and the statistics for grades weren't that good. So I, I think for a start, having some sort of politics thing on the curriculum, you know, for, from a very basic sense, would be, would be, would be a, an excellent start. But also, if we look at the European uh, election coverage, and how the parties targeted their voters, they need to embrace generally, they, and this is speaking very generally, they need to embrace social media more to reach the younger generation because uh, the younger generation are using apps and social media and, and portable communication. Um, and it just doesn't cut it doing the odd interview on, on BBC News. So I, I, th I feel by looking at their campaigns, they really didn't, um, it didn't appeal to the younger voters at, at, at all. Those Facebook pages that hadn't been updated for months on end, YouTube videos, YouTube channels that hadn't been updated for months on end. Uh, twit, Twitter was generally very, um, and I speak on a, on, a, on a broad note here with all the parties, Twitter was very impersonalised. It was sort of, um, you know, Tories vote to do this, link, Labour votes to do this, link. Whereas you can actually directly address your voters and, and get back to people's tweets and say, hey, yeah, I agree with you, or, you know, actually engage with people. Um, it all seems very distant. So I think that, that's, where they could be, that's where they could be doing better to engage young people. And what kind of, what kind of engagement might that be? You know, is, there, is, there a, is there a possibility, do you think, of some kind of full comprehension of political issues with these voters who aren't being addressed at the moment? You know, how can, how can they be informed in a, a full and effective way? It's difficult because many people have many different political views. So if you teach something in, in, in school, I'm assuming that you've got to kind of cover the whole spectrum, which is very, very, um, very big. That, that's very, it's very difficult because where do you start with politics? Because it's, it's so broad and so large. Um, I never got taught anything political. I just sort of followed mainly BBC News websites and just started to pick up on things. Um, I sort of got, I, mean, I won't say quite forcibly, but I got signed up to the Liberal Democrats by my godfather. And I was their youngest <laughs> member for a while. I used to do leaflet things, and then he, he got me speaking at some conferences, and so he'd sort of throw me up there two minutes before without telling me, and be up in, up in front of this big crowd reading about things that I didn't understand a word about on a script. You know, he just wanted to get pushed through, so he wanted a young person that everyone would be sympathetic for. Um, but then I started, that's how I started to engage, because then I started to look at some of these issues and think, well, mm, I don't really agree with that, or mm, I, yeah, I kind of agree with that. And I started to look up things and uh, talk to people there. And that's how I became involved, but that's not really a generic 
I don't, I don't think that's, uh, that happens to everybody. No, I, don't, I mean, I don't know what your experience is. You said there's no formal curriculum. So, yeah, no, I, I just applied to join A-level politics at the end of this beginning of the year, but they say it was scrapped because it was only me and that, I think, one other person, so they didn't bother running it. But there's no sort of, to me, there was a lack of knowledge of what all the parties are doing. I don't really understand any of the campaigns or any of the policies for each of the parties because it's just not appealing to me. Mm-hmm. It just doesn't get taught to me at all. I just really don't quite understand. It's not just that, it's how the political system works as well. I mean, I think it's essential that everybody has a basic understanding of what's, uh, what's going on. Whether you want to vote or not, I think everybody needs a political understanding because at the end of the day it affects us all. Mm-hmm. You know, we're very privileged to have a democracy in this country, to have accountable politicians, and we are in the position to hold them accountable. Um, so I think it's essential for, for, for children, certainly, or, or the younger generation, to know how the political system works, to know how the voting system works, uh, to know what MPs can and can't do, and, and how, how the House of Lords works. And, I suppose that. that and that then they can start point. to generate their own sort of political yeah. views once you've got that basic understanding. There but, are two things there there's, there's the understanding of the system. Mm-hmm which you could do without any kind of political motivation or belief. Mm-hmm. It would almost be like an academic exercise. And then you're suggesting that the, the belief in a particular party or a particular you know, mode of politics would, would arise from that. I don't know, Alison, if you have any thoughts about that, given that you actually study politics. Yes, I mean, it's quite interesting saying that your politics course was, was scrapped because I did an exercise recently and I looked through all of the schools in the UK to see how many actually did offer politics and there is a substantial number and I think even more do offer it as a, a PSH, PSHE or something like mm, that, that's a yeah, yeah. sort of citizen, citizenship studies. Yeah, so there's, yeah. there's plenty there um, and there's, clearly you can teach um, how the political system works but I think there's other bits that don't necessarily get taught, so how do lobby groups work, how does business interest interact, it's quite a big picture mm. all in all, it's a little bit more than you know, maybe just what your MP does, and I think actually politicians themselves are a little bit guilty. UKIP MPs may be promising the world, I mean, you get us a UKIP MP in Parliament, and this is what we'll deliver. Well, they won't be able to deliver anything because they don't have the power to deliver that. So I think perhaps when politicians promise and then are quite obviously then un- unable to deliver, it does actually disappoint people. And I think also, um, you know, you're saying that you didn't really know about political parties or what they do, but I suspect perhaps you sign petitions or maybe you, you join organisations like Greenpeace or something like that. There's other things that you can do that are definitely political that you probably feel you know quite a lot about. And I wonder maybe what's the value of that activity compared to voting and, and are both things necessary? Is, is sort of expressing your politics now more a case of cherry picking the issues that match? because parties no longer have an ideology where you say, well, that's clearly what I believe in. Mm-hmm. You might go, sort of, sort of a bit Liberal Democrat, but I'm actually going to give some money regularly to these activities, and then I'm going to go on that march, and that's your, that's your basket of political views. It's more than just voting, it's more than just parties. What actually is the bigger picture here? I got the sense from some of the film, so I want to bring it back a little bit to, to media work, because this project is all about exploring and perhaps becoming citizens through through using media activity. The kinds of themes that came out which were not explicitly party political, no one was saying, you know, this is conservative ideology or Labour ideology in, in the films made by the young people. What kind of things struck you about those in terms of interests and values and motivation and concerns and fears in some cases? Do you want to pick up? So on I was that interested, one? very interested in the second video that was shown with the, uh, the girl who was speaking. It seemed quite powerful. She was quite knowledgeable about what she was mm-hmm. saying. A lot of people like me, I'm quite empowered by a powerful video. I quite like seeing people speak their views. And with like things like YouTube, where they can get a lot of views, that sort of thing. When she's speaking like that, it can get you really engaged in what she's saying. You can sort of understand everything that she's going through. And um, so a video like that would make me get more interested in things like that. Oh, that was a that was a beautifully made poetic yeah, it's piece. Nice. It's very pessimistic, though. Do you mm-hmm. find it pessimistic? Um, it, mm, not really. <laughs> that, that I to say. No, no. What to know? Tell um, say why. It seemed. I, I maybe this is my reading of it, but of course it is. But it seemed to paint a picture of a very repressive environment 
you know, and, and the visual dimension reinforced that. Mm. So there were lots of you know, bars and wires. And the rhymes were about being confined and held back. And you know, there were these sort of aspirational shots of birds flying. There's some kind of freedom out there, if only we could find it. But the corporate universe keeps us hemmed in. I wonder where the what the next step is from that. There's a parallel, I think, between that that poetic piece and what Russell Brand was saying. There was a clear painting in both situations of a desperate problem, um, and, and more explicitly, I suppose, Russell Brand said, "Well, I haven't actually got the answer yet, but it must involve things like not destroying the environment." And they were, I think, sort of two sides of the same coin, really. Neither provided an alternative option, so it's quite easy to say, oh, "I completely understand. We're in a real mess," but then nothing constructive so I think despite the fact I said well maybe you can pick and choose your ideology like you just go out shopping what actually exists to pull all of those different threads together and say right we will form a political party that will do this and here are the solutions so for all that there are different ways to kind of explore and engage people ultimately does it all come back to having a vote and actually exercising power through some sort of democratic set of institutions yeah and there's a and perhaps the, the message that people need is something as unambiguous and aspirational as that. Maybe it needs to be like Google's, you know, do no harm. Is that their phrase? Is that the, you know, if there was a party that said we're the do no harm party, maybe they would, they would get some traction. I don't know. So was there any hope in any of those films for any of you? I thought it was a negative, but, um, but not necessarily in a bad way. Um, it's interesting to hear people's views, but I think... I think we're incredibly lucky to have a, have a democracy. Obviously, you can't like everything that a particular government does, and often we do see it, you know, parties come in and they change something that works just purely because a previous party has implemented it and there's never been any issues before, but you know, just for the sake of it, they decide to change something and it might not necessarily work, but that's what we get every time. Um, I came back from Ukraine a few weeks ago and there's people there fighting for some sort of you know, democracy, they're, they're fed up with influence from Russia from what they see as this oppressiveness and they don't really care what they have in place but they know that what they've got is wrong um, and they want more freedom and it's, it's just so, so interesting to see, you see people criticising the democracy that we have here and really going to town on politicians but then people that don't have that, it's, it's, it's weird but um, it's the most fascinating thing to see. Yeah. Is there a parallel there that in the Ukraine, if they are demanding something different but not necessarily, again, putting forward a solution, and, and the same thing's happening yeah. here, so it's kind of always quite relative to... to what I saw in the, in the Maidan, in Independence Square, is the protesters, are, they're still there. They're not, they're not leaving, they're not planning on leaving. They, they, they all said to me repeatedly, we're staying here till the end. And I was saying, well, what is the end? What, what do you see as the end? We don't know. We're staying here till the end. Mm -hmm. And they just didn't have the answers. And the most interesting thing is they've been asked by the new government in Kiev to leave, but they won't. Um, and the problem is with governments is governments have to come to certain compromises and negotiations. And we've seen the separatists taking a strong hold um, in the east. And there's no doubt in my mind there's a Russian influence there. But the new government is, is, is likely going to have to do some sort of deal with these separatists. But then these, there's, these, there's the problem with these protesters in the Maidan in Independence Square. They're not going anywhere and there's no way that they want any sort of deal. They want it their way or the highway. And so it's going to be interesting to see how that unfolds. Um, yes. That's... Will there be another, another protest for this? I think they're looking at this idealised democracy um, when in fact they're going to have to come to some sort of negotiation um, the new the new government certainly with Russia and the, and the separatists so it'd be interesting to see how it unfolds but it's such a contrast to here I mean it is and there is some there, there is some kind of antagonistic force that's fueling resistance yeah. actually in the West we have to look for those equivalent I don't know what the equivalents are and I'm, I'm thinking about the mm. films again with it with a rather gloomy portrayal of young people and although one was very careful to say I'm not I'm not talking about all young people, but and then went on to talk about all young people, um, and even in the, the the poetic film, you know, the the writer herself was talking about being sort of seduced and blinded by the bright lights, and in Huddersfield, 
they were numbed by drugs and music and shopping and even in at the end of Ken Loach's film you know the injunction was to take your earbuds out and listen there's a picture painted of, of young people it's it's not just that they're not politically engaged it's that they're completely removed from reality to what extent is that fair or reasonable do you think no, I think that's I think that's, I think that's a fairly I think that's a fair statement. I think it's very general, but it, it, it's certainly fair. Many young people I've talked to and interviewed, they they want to engage, but they want the parties to engage with them, and they feel completely on a, on a different level. They feel rejected and neglected. As um, I think I think if, in case in in terms of parties, it, they need to sort of break down politics um, because. Yeah, if you're new and you're coming into it, then you, you can't you can't pick up on trade unions and, mm. and uh, you know, the European Union and trade deals. It, it it's not going to happen overnight. So I think they need to simplify a bit because they're missing out on a huge demographic of voters here. I mean, yeah, well, well, it's quite painful to watch political parties try and engage with young people. It's painful. It's really <laughs> painful. Did you see there was this great video that came out in um, I think it was the Danish Parliament, uh, Vote Man. Oh, I seen that. Look it up on YouTube. It's a <laughs> it's a video that the Parliament commissioned, and it certainly wouldn't get Ofcom approval here. Mm-hmm. It's sex, drugs, violence—they've chucked it all in to try and appeal to young voters into this animation, which is, um, yeah, brutal, really. And what, what does it promise to those young voters? It's saying uh, it's saying if you don't vote, we're going to hunt you down and kill you, basically. Okay. So, um, <laughs> it, yeah. I know it's um it's interesting, but it it went out it went viral though. So mm-hmm. maybe maybe that's it went viral on YouTube, not yeah. just in 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 that country, but also here. Uh, it's got millions and millions of views. So maybe maybe that sense of controversy, <coughs> viral videos, perhaps it was a subliminal plan. Um, it, you know, it worked. Um, that was very interesting, but it it is embarrassing when you when you see politicians try and engage with young people. But let's just come down to come down to the basics. Why don't they go and visit schools and universities more often? without doing all this social media stuff. But when you were talking about being thrust into the spotlight as a, as a juvenile Lib Dem, I was reminded of William Hague's first <laughs> performance at a Tory party conference at the age of, what, 16 or something, wasn't it? Which was equally cringe-making. I don't know if that's probably on YouTube as well. Yeah. Um, so thinking about, I mean, one of the things Russell Brand said was that people don't feel they have a voice, they feel disempowered. And I think there is, there's definitely something in that, and maybe that's something that this project could, could draw out if people are able to find some kind of voice through, through creative media practice that is about you know, social reality. What, what kinds of things could come out of this project next, do you think? What, what kinds of things might people be able to say? What kind of things do you think people might want to say? Should we start at this end? Yeah, I think it's more sort of the video media sort of side of it is getting the awareness of maybe people, sort of young people who are disengaged from things like politics. Not not many people out there are aware of, <coughs> not myself, like the campaigns or anything like that. They're just not they're not engaged with it because they just don't feel it it, it works for them or anything like that. Getting sort of viral video things on Facebook, YouTube things like that that gets them engaged because I spend probably most of my time in my bedroom either on Facebook, YouTube, doing coursework, anything like that. I don't speak to many people outside in the real world, apart from whether it's on a phone app or anything like that. The way that they can go to get to me is through something, through a media, something like that, something that they can get me engaged in and make me aware of how they're doing it. Or, say, bring it into some sort of school curriculum or introduce sort of a current affairs sort of thing to get me more engaged in what's going on, because otherwise, there's not many ways that I, I think that I can get interested in it otherwise after that. Would that be the only thing that would prompt you to produce your own sort of media artifact that engaged with social reality or issues? Or... Yeah, I mean, could possibly. I mean, without, without much knowledge or understanding of it myself, I don't think I'll be brave enough to sort of make a video or anything like that for myself, but mm-hmm. having someone else with that sort of knowledge and sort of inspiration for young people to get into that sort of thing then might inspire me to have a look, get more interested, read up on it, otherwise that's one thing. Okay. What do you think, Alison? Well, I think you, you said you didn't have the experience to do that. I think where you suddenly tasked with creating a video, you certainly would very quickly get to get to uh, grips with your topic. Um, I think all of these people that probably started off doing these projects 
will have probably had some preconceptions that have probably started down the road, spoken to a few people and had their eyes open because when you go out outside of your comfort zone and you talk to people, you're going to find things out. So I think it's really powerful. Actually doing it is powerful. If watching it inspires you, that's excellent. But I suppose my question to you would be, you watch it, you're inspired, you think, oh yeah, this is clearly a thing. Something has to be done about this this problem. But then where do you where do you discuss that? Because you, you form your political ideas through through debate, through discussing it with other people. Sure, you have social media, you can chat on Facebook, you can talk on a forum, but whether you end up talking past each other, whether you solidify your ideas or, or whether you just repeat what you hear, there's a danger perhaps that we don't really fully explore and, and test in a kind of debate style what our ideas are. I went to a, a party the other day and I sort of just mentioned in passing something about wanting a career in politics and a, a young girl said to me well the first thing that you need to do is get rid of the NHS and we should just all pay a little bit in, into a pot to provide a system and I thought that's a bit funny I wonder why on earth she thinks that that would be the right system to have a, a private insurance system I said well why do you think that that, that would be the best thing well that's what my mum said we ought to do and so there's like an absorbing of these ideas mm-hmm sort of kind of warped and twisted out of all recognition and then just repeated without question. Because actually what needs to happen is a space for debate to test your ideas. So you need to be inspired, but then what happens after that? How do you, how do those ideas reach maturity? Yeah, yeah. And a project like this encourages people to get into those debates. inevitably Mm -hmm. brings them to the surface, doesn't it? It does, yes. You have some some production tensions where you actually, in creating your film, you you have your ideas. It sounds like you're at quite a fun party because usually I get told to shut up when I, when I talk about politics. So um, I've got shut up after a while. Yeah, about an hour ago actually, I was uh, just having a, a, a drink with somebody and uh, I started talking about the military cutbacks and how they're re- relying on reservists and I got a new, unanimous sort of uh, yeah, shut up, Edward, stop talking about <laughs> politics. Uh, nobody's interested, which was rather interesting. Um, but I think also I think it's it's uh, not just curriculums but also the media that's uh, that, that, that holds a responsibility here. Um, I recently did some coverage on the European elections. We ended up doing a big live studio broadcast with several studios in the media school for, for several hours. Um, and in generating that content, I shadowed MEPs, um, interviewed M- MEPs and MPs, and went to the European Parliament and, and somehow managed to uh, scam a press pass. So I sort of managed to wander around and go into debates and see what was going on. And also conducting a load of interviews with people like uh, Godfrey Bloom or Brian Watson. Yeah. And there's very contrasting views there, but the whole experience really, it wasn't, at first it wasn't about generating coverage for the EU elections, it was actually my my personal um, self trying to sort of get a grip on European politics a bit more. Um, I understand the basic things that go on, uh, but at the moment I could probably fall into one of those one of those pools of, of disengaged voters because I don't I, I don't really know exactly what sort of political party I, I would vote for. Mm-hmm. Straight off, I, I sympathise with certain issues from from all of the parties, including UKIP. I can sympathise with a few of their issues, although I do debate whether they'd be able to implement them or not. Um, and so it's more of a quest for me to get out there and, and uh, do these interviews and um, uh, learn for myself. But I think that that young people need to be encouraged more to do that. Perhaps so that, through the curriculum, activity. not necessarily learning about politics, but getting kids out there to learn about politics themselves and, and do films like this. And what was re- very good about the films is that it is young people making them, and that's, you know, it's very interesting. Um, Julian, I think you would like to just conclude in, a, in some form in a moment, but can I just thank the panel very much and um, thank you all for attending. And let's give the panel a round of applause. Over to Julian for any final words. Well, that's all I was going to do. I was going to thank the panel. Thank you. <laughs> and thanks to the kids of the panel for, uh, for being so sensitive as well. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, small audience, but a uh, really interesting discussion. Thanks ever so much to the panel members for uh, volunteering to do that. Thank you. And we will put the film on the website and be in touch with you through social media. <laughs> um, so thanks a lot. Enjoy the rest of the evening of the festival if you can to anything else. Yeah. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Thank you very much, guys. That was thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.